Good afternoon, Cedarfield. How is everyone doing today? Um, I am doing well, and we have a change of venue, as you probably have noticed. I'm here in the Garden of Eden, um, coming to you live from our chapel, as we are setting up for a big event in the Great Room, or the Fellowship Hall tomorrow. So I got moved. So hopefully you enjoy the new environment. So far, um, I am enjoying it. Good little privacy. Um, anyway, I thought I would tell you about um, a trip I'm going on this weekend because then it ties into our topic for today. Um, I am going home to South Louisiana, uh, which is where I was born and raised in a town called Homa, Louisiana. Uh, it's about 60 miles southwest of New Orleans, but it's truly down in the bayous and the swamps. We have alligators, we've got the whole thing. So it's, um, I, you know, it's kind of, I, I just tell people I'm from New Orleans because no one's really heard of where I'm from, but truly it's very, um, it's its own little entity aside from New Orleans. It's not a terribly small town, it's kind of medium, um, but I love it, it's still home. My family's all still there. Um, and it's beautiful, beautiful country. Um, if you love the swamps and all of the interesting things that grow and live there. Um, we've got lots of interesting people and folks. We've got Mardi Gras, all that good stuff. Uh, we also are known for our absolutely delicious food. So that is my favorite thing to do when I go home is I just want to eat at all the places and get all the seafood I can. Um, so that's what we're going to talk about today. Since I'm going home to eat some good seafood, I thought, well, we'll discuss seafood on the show today and learn all about it. Alrighty, so let's jump in. Um, we'll dive in, right? Because we're talking about animals that live in the water. All right, so um, seafood is typically, you know, there's lots of different categories of seafood. So um, we'll talk about the main one really is um, vertebrates versus invertebrates, um, which, you know, to be a little less scientific is kind of fin fish versus shellfish. So those are the less scientific terms for fish, the more commercial layman's terms. Uh, but the fin fish are, are vertebrates and so they have a vertebrae, a backbone, um, and these can be fresh or salt water. And then we also have our invertebrates which don't have the backbone. Um, and then within the invertebrate category, so these are what we typically think of as our shellfish. So within that category, we have our crustaceans, which are our crabs, lobsters, shrimp, crawfish or crayfish. Down in Louisiana, we call them crawfish, or crawdads. Um, anyway, so these are the ones that have the segmented bodies. If you think back to ninth grade biology class, um, I think about, you know, when I'm eating those foods, you know, their bodies can break in half really quickly and you've got the, you know, different segments or whatever. We won't go into too much anatomy. Um, and then we also have our mollusks. So these can be our bivalves, which are like our mussels, um, clams, etc., oysters, etc. So those have the two shells that are hinged together. Um, you can also have a univalve, which are um, typically animals that have like just kind of one big shell around them. So um, like your conchs and your abalone, um, also like a snail, you can think of it in those terms. And then um, also under the mollusk category are our cephalopods. So cephalopods are our octopus and squid. They don't aren't they aren't known for that uh, tough you know hard outer shell because they you know have the rubbery texture, but they do have what's called a cuddle bone, which is like an internal shell um, that helps them uh, with buoyancy, which I didn't know I learned that today. Um, so there is a hard shell in a sense, kind of inside of them that I guess protects whatever organs they have in there, and again helps with their buoyancy when they're um, floating in the water. All right, and so then also we have kind of the distinction between fresh water and salt water. Um, so typically our salt water fish uh, are gonna be more robust in flavor and have kind of a more distinctive flavor. Once you think of like salmon and tuna, um, snapper, 
um, those things that you know typically have a really good flavor or a distinct flavor. And then our saltwater fishes um, like perch and trout and catfish, things like that, or freshwater, sorry, um, that we find in lakes and streams and rivers. You know, those are tend to be the white, milder fish, have um, milder flavor, uh, but can still be delicious. So then that kind of leads us to um, another interesting fact about fish that I learned when I was doing this research is that pigment, you know, some fish have a darker color, some are bright white. We have salmon and trout that have that very distinct pink and orange flavor or color. Um, even shrimp have kind of a pinky flavor, or sorry, uh, color. We're talking about pigments, that's color, not flavor. Um, so the pigment of a fish, the flesh that we eat, depends on a couple of things. So one, it depends on their muscle structure and that depends on how they move in the water. So some fish, um, I'm gonna use the you know, four, you know, four year old fish uh, you know, hand gesture here. So some fish, the ones you know, that are larger or long, that um, travel for really long distances, and they kind of have to um, build up a lot of endurance so they don't want to expend as much energy. So they have long flowing movements like this. These are called slow twitch muscle fibers. Um, so those are gonna tend to have a darker, deeper color. So salmon, again, it's a classic example. It's a darker pigmented fish and they swim really long distances and they kind of have that slow movement um, as opposed to smaller fish um, that have what is called a fast twitch muscle fiber. And those are the ones that, shoop, 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 you know, you see them swimming through the water like super fast and they're super, you know, they're fun to watch you know, skirting around the water. So those have a fast muscle, fast twitch muscle fibers, which then tends to lead to white. And that goes into things like myoglobin and all that, and that gets a little sciencey, but just suffice it to know um, that that is one distinction. And then also the color of the flesh is affected by whatever the fish eats. Um, so depending on what kind of pigments what kind of molecules are in the, you know, the little critters that they eat can, can affect the color ultimately of their flesh. So <clears throat> something fun that I learned is that, uh, again, going back to salmon that has that distinct orange pink color, also things like shrimp and trout, they eat a lot of insects and crustaceans in the water that have um, a pigment called astaxanthin. And that is a pigment of the carotenoid or carotenoid um, pigment category. So this is also responsible for these carotenoids or carotenoids are also responsible for coloring things like carrots and sweet potatoes and all of those really brightly orange and pink and yellow foods that we eat. Um, and this carotenoid is a precursor to vitamin, vitamin A. So um, you know, we talk a lot about eating brightly colored foods and this is one of the reasons because um, those pigments also serve as precursors to vitamins and antioxidants, etc. So when you're eating your salmon, you're also getting a nice little dose of vitamin A, which is good for your eyes and your skin and all kinds of good things. One fun thing I learned, again, when looking in this up, is that is the same pigment that's this specifically this astaxanthin is the pigment that's responsible for flamingos bright pink color. So there you go. I thought that was terribly interesting. Um, and so the more flamingos are taken out of their natural habitat, habitat um, like in a zoo or something, they'll tend to fade, that pink color tends to fade if they don't have exposure to these little insects and things that have that pigment inside of them. So there you go, little fun um, cocktail party story. All right, so another big concern when it comes to fish and seafood is the freshness. For whatever reason, for me at least, I mean, I know all um, meat and flesh that we eat, you know, you have to be concerned with foodborne illnesses, um, whether it's pork or beef or chicken or whatever, poultry. But for whatever reason, fish, it seems like there's a whole other level of things that can be in fish that can be harmful for us 
Um, and so we have to be concerned with um, making sure we're eating fish safely. Um, also, fish just has that fishy smell that we're all familiar with. Um, that's not very enjoyable and can really turn a lot of people off. So it's important that you're getting good fresh fish so that you're not exposed to that fishy smell, which is not very appealing. Anyway, so I know most people here at Cedar Field, you're probably not going out and buying fish too much anymore because Cedar Field has amazing fish in the Cedar Grill. And if I were going to eat fish, I'm just going to eat theirs because they're going to cook it way better than I am. And then you don't have to worry about buying it and all of this good stuff. Um, but if you were, you want to kind of give it the sniff test. If it smells fishy, then it's probably not as fresh as it should be to be enjoyable. But you also want to look at the skin. If it still has the scales on it, they should be shiny and bright and tight looking and not dull. You also want to look at the eyes. The eyes should be bulging and not kind of sunken in or deflated looking. Um, and then you also want to try to buy the fish that is not in direct contact with ice. A lot of times when you buy it at the market or the store, you know, it's on beds of ice. So you want to try not to get fish that's really in direct contact with that ice because it can kind of damage the flesh. And then you also just want to make sure the flesh looks fresh and doesn't look spongy or kind of crumbly. It kind of gets that crumbly look because um, it's probably been degraded too much. All right, so um, the fishy smell, if you want to get a little sciency, is so there is a mo there are two molecules within the flesh of fish. One is called trimethylamine and another is called a phospholipid and those are bound together. And then as the skin, once the fish dies and it starts to degrade, we have bacteria and enzymes that are um, kind of serving to break those apart. And when that trimethylamine is released from the phospholipid, that's what gives off that fishy smell. So one way that you can counter that is to put something acidic on it. And that kind of neutralizes that trimethylamine, which gives off that smell, that fishy smell, um, and then you don't have that smell. So it kind of neutralizes it and gets rid of it. So that's why lemon juice is so popular on fish and that's why sometimes you'll see lemons kind of you know it's displayed in a market they'll have lemons around because that lemon is very very acidic and that will kind of help that fishy smell so little tidbit all right so well this is a nutrition show right so we should talk about nutrition um, related to seafood so i am here to tell you that seafood is a very healthy nutritious thing that you can eat, I would encourage you to make sure you're getting plenty of seafood in your diet. Um, and here's why. So uh, fish, are, fish and seafood is relatively low calorie. Um, it's a very low calorie and efficient source of protein. So remember a couple of shows back we talked about um, insects and our friends the cicadas and how they are such a great and efficient source of protein. Well, fish are also um, in the same vein in that they're low calorie, but also high in protein. There are pretty much no carbs in fish as is with most you know, animal-based um, flesh and meats and things like that. Um, but they are also um, fatty, but compared to other sources of protein, meat-based proteins like beef, pork, and poultry, um, it's a lower fat content. So even though there is fat in fish, it's lower fat relative to those other sources of um, meat. And those other sources of meat are more um, associated with saturated fat, which is the least heart healthy fat. Um, fish are very high in those healthy unsaturated fats, particularly omega-3 fatty acids. So you've probably heard of omega-3 fatty acids. Um, there's a very sciencey explanation as to what they are, but they are very good for you and you should be striving to get a healthy dose of omega-3 fatty acids. Um, they're very healthy for your heart, your brain, your cognition, your immune system, your eyes, all kinds of things. So definitely um, fish is certainly a good source of that. Um, the, well, we'll talk about um, kind of the amount of fish that you should have um, in a little bit. So 
one of the downsides of the bad reputation that seafood can get sometimes is the cholesterol level in some of the crustaceans, particularly shrimp and um, octopus. They do have higher levels of cholesterol, but we have not we, I'm not doing the research, I'm just reading it. Um, research has shown that uh, dietary cholesterol is not as bad for us as we once thought. So this is kind of the same vein as the egg controversy, the egg debate. So we are now finding out that the cholesterol in our food is not affecting our heart health as much as we thought it is. So it's not as much to be concerned about like we used to be, especially with eggs and things. So I wouldn't be um, limiting your shrimp just because of the cholesterol. Um, so think, keep that in mind. Um, fish and seafood can be a very good source of a lot of vitamins and minerals, particularly our B vitamins, our vitamin A, which we talked about, um, and then also vitamin D. So, so vitamin D is one of those vitamins that we all need, where all, a lot of us are deficient in, especially older adults. It's just a really hard vitamin to get through food. And so um, there aren't a lot of foods that are good sources of vitamin D. So the one exception um, is fish, particularly fish that are packaged and sold with the bones still in them. So if you think about our canned fish like sardines and anchovies, where you're, you know, they're eating, they're tiny and you're actually eating the bones and everything in them. So it's the, you know, the bones that are providing calcium and vitamin D. So those are some good sources. Um, you can also get um, iron and iodine, all kinds of minerals that are important. One thing I would warn against is if you are a fan of canned fish, particularly um, smoked and cured and dried fish, maybe like lox, like the um, dry smoked salmon, uh, or pickled things like pickled herring is really popular. You just want to be cautious of the sodium levels on some of those foods. It doesn't necessarily change the nutrition content in any other form, but you're adding a lot of salt to those, and that is that is the process of curing and drying, is you're adding salt, and that takes a lot of the moisture out and preserves it, but it also obviously is just adding a lot of sodium. So if that's something that you're trying to limit in your diet, which we all should be, you want to be cautious of that. Um, you also want to, if you're buying a lot of canned um, fish like tuna, um, to try to buy the canned tuna or other types of fish that might be canned or stored in oil, you want to try to get the ones that are stored in water versus the oil, simply just because the oil adds a lot of um, extra calories that you don't necessarily need. Um, so you want to get the, the water. And then also, uh, when you're preparing your fish or you're getting it at a restaurant or here at the Cedar Grill, you should um, the preferred way to enjoy your fish, the healthier way I should say, to, to enjoy your fish. I have my own preferences as far as taste goes and flavor, but um, the healthier way to enjoy fish would be baked or broiled, steamed, and grilled versus breaded and fried, unfortunately, because I love a good fried seafood of any sort, um, whether it's shrimp or whatever, but that certainly adds to the, you know, the fat and uh, content. So can pack on the calories and depending on what you're frying it in, you know, some oils are healthier than others. All righty. So let's talk a little bit about, well, so the recommendation for amounts of fish, you don't have to eat fish every day. Um, you know, and I know fish is kind of controversial as far as flavor. Not everybody is a big fan of fish. Um, so again, that goes back to that fishy smell, and which then carries into the taste. And I understand that. I personally love seafood. Um, so the recommendation in order to reap the benefits of the omega-3 fatty acids is to have fish about twice a week. And that's usually about enough to get what you need as far as those omega-3s. Um, so... Um, it's a, and we're going to talk a little bit about the mercury concerns. So it's important to get enough fish throughout the week to, you know, reap the benefits, but then you also don't want to go overboard because you do have to be concerned about the mercury contents. So mercury, um, it occurs naturally in, in our environment, in the earth and in the water, but also with water, there are concerns that it can 
um, fall into the water from industrial pollution, et cetera. Um, so it does accumulate in our, in our seafood supply. And it comes into the fish through their gills as they're respirating, and then it kind of gets stored into their flesh. So then when we eat it, we're consuming that mercury too. Certain levels of mercury is totally fine in our bodies, but it can start to accumulate if you're eating too much fish. So also there's the concern for the fish that are at the higher end of the food chain, because if you think about it, they're eating the fish that's been eating the fish that's been eating the fish. And all of these fish have mercury, so they have a tendency to one they live longer and they're larger and they eat all of these other fish that are eating all these other fish and so that mercury is really accumulating in them so the fish that we have the highest levels of mercury that we should be the most concerned about are pacific blue marlin king mackerel tile fish shark and swordfish so these are you know these are pretty specialty fish you don't see these very often. We're probably not eating those as often, so we're probably okay. A lot of the fish that have the lower levels of mercury are usually the more common things that you're buying in restaurants and stuff, so it's probably not a huge concern. The biggest concern for um, mercury consumption are for um, women who are pregnant or are thinking of getting pregnant uh, and also developing children. So it's not as big a concern um, in adults, but it certainly is if it starts to accumulate. Um, so the CDC recommends, or the FDA, sorry, they recommend that um, people can safely consume up to 12 ounces of fish per week. So if you think about a normal three to four ounce serving, you're eating two or three of those per week, you're totally fine. So um, just keep that in mind. So if you're eating fish every single day, that might be a consideration, but a couple of times a week, it should be okay. All right, so what about this whole enjoyment of raw fish? So we think about Japanese and their love of um, sushi and in America, I love sushi. So our enjoyment of raw fish, also foods like um, raw oysters and things like that that we eat raw and uncooked. And then also um, fish like tuna, where if you get a steak, you might get it rare, which I enjoy. Um, so, it's delicious. Raw fish can be, if that's your thing, it can be delicious. I enjoy it. I will probably be eating some oysters when I go home. Um, but there is certainly a risk for foodborne illness, just as with any other flesh or you know animal-based proteins and meats. Um, so the CDC does recommend that you are cooking all of your seafood thoroughly. Um, however, it can be consumed raw. That's just kind of a risk that you you take up when you're enjoying it. Um, and you know, the more reputable source of um, seafood, you know, the less likely you will be to um, to acquire these foodborne illnesses. But it is something to be concerned about. So keep that in mind. You know, you kind of have to weigh the risk versus the benefits. Um, but there are a couple of different types of raw fish that are enjoyed. So I learned there is a difference between, so when we talk about sushi, that's not necessarily referring to the fish, even though that's kind of the common term that we use. So sushi is actually referring to the rice that we typically prepare, you know, in the Japanese cuisine that we pre prepare that fish with. Um, so the real term for the actual raw fish is sashimi which I hear that term, but I rarely use it. We always just kind of use sushi as kind of that blanket term. So the raw fish is sashimi, and then depending on how it's served, it, there are all of these different names um, for it. And then there's also ceviche, <laughs> um, and that is raw fish that is served uh, with some sort of an acidic marinade, like a lemon or a lime juice, and again, there is a reaction that happens with that acidity and the flesh, which turns it white. Um, but keep in mind, it's still considered raw and it's still subject to some foodborne illnesses. Um, anyway, so let's see. Oh, and then also our mollusks are the most at risk for being polluted with these contaminants because they're kind of, they're found in shallower waters or they're considered bottom feeders. Um, so they can um, 
pose a higher risk, such as oysters. I think that's pretty common. Um, all right, so if you're cooking your fish, you just want to make sure for fin fish that you're getting up to an internal temperature of 145. Um, you want to cook it until the flesh is kind of pearly white and opaque, not opaque anymore, or you want it opaque. You don't want it to have that translucent look. Um, and then if you're cooking some shell or, or bivalves, you want to cook them until those shells open up and then you kind of know that's a sign that they're ready. All right, so one other thing that I thought was interesting was the concept of um, surimi. So this is kind of like your imitation crab meat. If you go to the store and you buy that, which when I was a kid I used to love, my mom would just buy bags of it at the deli and we'd just eat it as a snack. Um, so this came about from um, just one fish being, seafood being expensive, and then also the issue with how perishable it is. Um, so the Japanese discovered over 900 years ago that if you mince it um, or ground it and then you add some seasonings and also some other things to kind of texturize it like cornstarch or egg, egg whites, things like that, um, you can kind of shape it and it will preserve for a lot longer, stay preserved for a lot longer, and then you can kind of use it as we do today to kind of replace um, other types of you know fish so typically you'll this is a good way to utilize some of the less popular types of fish like for instance they use pollock a lot or certain types of cod to make this you know kind of turn it into other types of um, fish or seafood like crabs and so they use this a lot for like fish sticks and things like that so if you're a fan of those which I was growing up um, you've probably had a good bit of surimi even though we um, refer to it here as imitation or fish sticks or whatever. Um, so one other thing to consider with seafood is, like I said earlier, the source from which you're getting your fish or your seafood and just kind of the sustainability factors um, that's becoming a lot more prevalent nowadays, um, you know, with growing levels of pollution in our waters, etc. Um, you want to just take into consideration where you're getting your fish to cut down on those contaminants. Um, also, wild caught fish tends to preserve the nutrition a lot better um, and just cuts down on some of those contaminants that you might encounter in farm raised fish. So, you know, do your research if these are things that are important to you or that you want to um, consider as far as environmental factors and the way fishermen are treated and um, you know how sustainable the business practices are etc all right so that wraps up our topic now i am fully ready to get home and eat some good seafood um, if you have any further questions or comments about seafood if you're you know concerned about uh, foodborne illnesses or whether you're getting enough or too much etc i'd be happy to talk about it with you just give me a call or email me or come on by my office I'd be happy to talk about it. So I hope that you enjoyed this topic. And um, I think we will be off next week for resident council. So that'll be my break from the show. And then we'll be back the next week with uh, Mr. Topic. I don't know yet. So anyway, hope to see y'all then. And I hope you have a great week. Bye-bye.